ready? Okay, let's call to order the committee of the whole meeting for Tuesday, November 7th. It is 7.30 p.m. First item on the agenda is roll call, please. Rosado? Here. Atac? Here. Stark? Here. Chancet? Here. Wolf? Here. Salvati? Here. Brown? Here. O'Brien? Here. Callahan? Here. Meitzler? Here. Malay? Here. Ewer? Here. Cerrone? Here. And McFadden? Here. Okay, let the record reflect that all 14 of the aldermen are present for this meeting. And could I remind everyone before we get started to pull the microphones up close to them so that we <coughs> get everybody on the mic. Next item is item two, items removed, added, or changed. Laura, do we have anything? No. Anybody else have anything? Okay. Item three, matters from the public for items that are not on the agenda. If there's anybody in the public that would like to address us for an item that is not on the agenda. Okay. Item four is resolution 17-111-R, authorizing execution of a task order number four with Power Systems Engineering Group for professional service engineering related to the Highland electric improvements for an amount not to exceed $25,955. Alderman Wolf. Business. Public. Or Alderman O'Brien. Public Utilities. Alderman O'Brien. <laughs> Him too. Well, we have uh, at the Northeast substation, the, as in the memo says, we have a couple of uh, uh, generators or transformers. One is 30 years old, it's at its end of life, and we'll be looking to replace this. Uh, I was talking with Gary, we we're trying to put this on some sort of a system that yearly we'll be doing these test go to contracts just to try to maintain our redundant system through the area. And so I'll leave it at that. Gary, do you want to fill us all in on? Um, sure. I, I'm going to, well, we, I'll, we'll skip to, that was number five. So I want to, I'll, I'll, we'll skip number four. Okay, for I'll, so I'm sorry. About, that's okay. If it's okay, we'll talk about that one since you've already started yeah, that'll be great. that one. Um, that's number five. That's the, the um, power systems engineering design for a new distribution substation. Um, over the course of this year, I've shared with you several emails and several updates as to what's been happening with our Paramount substation. If you guys recall, we had failure out there this year. We've had failures out there in the past. Many of you won't, won't recall back in about eight years ago, we had a major failure just like we had this year. <clears throat> Where the substation went offline for for several weeks, um, so that substation's nearing the end of its life. At least one of the transformers is, and when we built the 138 substation, we left room out there, extra room. So we're going to build a new 12 kV substation in that facility, which was designed for it. That'll allow us to then go into the Paramount facility and take out the old transformer, which is near, or really basically at its end of life, and rehab the other transformer. That'll all occur really over the years 2018, 2019. So this is the first contract for design of the component, which includes the new, new transformer in the Northeast substation and all the infrastructure associated with that. Um, so this is, as, as, as Rahad and Bob Rugby put together uh, the memo, this is really the first of several projects over the next two years for rehabbing and completely replacing Paramount. So we are recommending approval of 17-123 for 385000 with Power Systems Engineering. Um, you'll recall, well, again, I, I, we used, um, we used, another name even dropped out of my head, a firm out of St. Louis for the 138 project. We had quite a few problems with them. And we tried a couple of other smaller engineering firms um, on some projects. Uh, one did Cherry Park Substation. They did a fairly decent job, uh, but then they also had some issues on some other projects. Power Systems Engineering recently did for us the Colonial Village um, project, as well as the Fabian Transmission Project, and both of those projects went really well. So that's why we're recommending to go with Power Systems <coughs> Engineering. Uh, we had we had really good experience with them, and, and so we're confident in their ability to to, to do this work. So, any comments or questions? Are we on item five? We're on item, item four? five. We jumped to five. Item five. Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry. On, on item five, I assume that we're looking into the future and doing this too, because we do have a lot of industrial area out there that can yet be developed. Is so as a part of this kind of planning for the future as well, or, or is that something that 
So looking in very narrow scope, this is replacement of a substation. In the memo they talk about a circuit improvement. That circuit improvement will provide more redundancy and more capacity up there. That kind of will address your question. That's the future as part of these chain of projects which we'll be doing over the next couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. Scott, did you have something? Anybody else? Anyone care to make a motion? So moved. Second. Motion by Salvati, second by you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Consent? Consent. Okay. All right, let's jump back to item number four then, Alderman O'Brien, right. which is 17111-R. Uh, back in 2013, we uh, hired a company to kind of survey all our overhead lines, our overhead uh, poles. They did so, and we've been uh, addressing that since. And uh, we're going to go into the Highland overhead electric improvements in 2018 to replace some of that aging infrastructure, basically. I guess in 2016, we did the Colonial Road and Colonial Village in 2017. So it's basically just a maintenance issue for our overhead infrastructure. Does that sum it up, Gary? Yeah, it does. <laughs> It's basically the almost exactly the same scope that we're just completing now in Colonial Village. So replacement of the poles, replacement of the overhead wires, infrastructure um, to do with it in Highlands. Any uh, comments or questions? Dave? Gary? Does, <clears throat> as you mentioned in your memo here and you just mentioned, you've been doing it in different sections of the town. And I know you tested all the wood poles throughout the entire city. Does this look like it's going to be an ongoing every year thing that has to be done to try to? These know, are large projects that we know of. Um, the Osmos poll study still, we still have, I don't know, I'd probably say hundreds of poles that are part of the Osmos study that still need to get replaced. Um, we, we chose these projects first because these are like whole collections, entire neighborhoods of, of infrastructure that reaches reach the end of their, end of their life. Um, the other poles that we have, after we get through these big projects, are onesies, twosies. They're throughout the system, and um, we've addressed some, of, many of them already. But we still have many of them to go. Hopefully, that answers your. Yeah. Right. There, there. One more question. There was some discussion a few years back about the condition of the concrete poles on yes. Wilson Street. Yes. Is there a you got a date in mind of when we think we're going to have to do something? We actually with included those? some funds in the 20, uh, 2018 budget proposal uh, that City Council will consider. Um, you're in the business, Mike, you're in the business. Uh, there's really no long-term solution that's going to permanently cure those poles. They're going to continue to deteriorate at this point. Um, the water is infiltrating those poles, causing the, the rebar to rust. The rebar rusts, it expands to 10 times its normal size, causes the concrete to spall. Concrete spalls, introduces more water into the poles. The cycle is just going to get worse and worse as, as time goes on. 2018, we're hoping to put a Band-Aid on them. Hopefully to seal. Not, I mean, you really don't want to seal because once you get the moisture in, if you seal it, there's a sort. of well, moisture gets in and it's sealed, then you then you really have a problem. You, you've got to let the poles breathe, but we can cover up those spalled areas and those exposed areas of rebar to try and slow it down. The, the solution is that those poles are are on the downslope of their of their life. So in 2018, there's going to be some. Yeah, I think we have 20 or 30 thousand dollars in work. there just for repair work for those poles. I just want to say that, uh, you know, our electric utility, it's, it's ours, and, and we pride ourselves on the service that we provide and, and the redundant system that we have, and this is just maintaining that to, to keep at least the, 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 the quality to a high standard. So, uh, anyone else? Anyone care to make a motion? So moved. Second. Moved by you, a second by McFadden. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It was my, the second was my. Was that? The second was me. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> second Consent. was my slot. Impersonating me again. Consent? <laughs> Ventriloquism. Sorry about that. All right. We're we'll, going to move on then to item number six, which is the approval and the consideration of deposition, disposition of certain city owned properties. Alderman ATEC? Um, yes, yeah, so staff has presented us with a memo making some recommendations to do on um, for some of the properties um, that is our city owned, including the Tomley building. Um, the 
North Water Street across from, um, over here across from the Historical Society and, um, I'm sorry, 2050 West Main Street. And they're recommending that we hire a broker, two different brokers actually, one that specializes more in residential, one that specializes for the um, property on Water Street, and one that specializes more in development for the Tomley building. And um, they're also suggesting that um, they're going to uh, change the RFP for the Tomley building, say that the plan could include demolition of the building. So, um, and they're also suggesting that we talk about uh, the situation with the food pantry, which is a city-owned property, and considering perhaps helping them move to the vacant land that we own west of town on Main Street. Our, would you like to add anything, Chris? Uh, no, I think that, that clears it up. We were given some assignments. One was to look at the RFP, and so we changed that. Mm -hmm. As you indicated, we essentially deleted the condition that we won't consider any proposal that involves demolishing and removing the Tomley building. Okay. So that would be taken out in the RFP. But we, before we actually send the RFP out, as you said, there was some discussion as we talked about the RFP. Well, what about selling the land uh, with the use of a broker? And so we've developed some strategies on that as well. And what we did was um, speak to some, uh, I spoke to two national actually, uh, their regional office brokers as to their interest in representing it, uh, any of the properties, the commercial properties, the Tomley building and the 2150, which is the vacant parcel west of Aldi, the city owns. And the sense was that both properties would be better, the city would be better served if we had someone local, independent probably, and that knew the market, uh, especially with the Tomley building, and that it's a small building, uh, you'd probably likely the market will be somebody that knows Batavia, knows Batavia's building stock, uh, knows the rental rates, and uh, and also the larger piece as well that would be most likely better served. We'd get on the attention, the radar screen of a smaller broker, uh, but more commercial oriented, and also one that knew development and entitlement process because that is not an existing building, it's a vacant land. So, um, as you said, we, as we talked about the 2150 Main Street, the west, westernmost property, uh, there was discussion, there's been repeated discussion from time to time at staff meetings about uh, the Interfaith Food Pantry and their needing to perhaps relocate and, and needing more room and expansion. And so some of the conversation was, uh, you know, maybe this is a possible site for them uh, and so I said, well, look, if that's the consideration, uh, then before we retain a broker to represent it, uh, we need to call the question with the council, is this something you're interested in? And uh, if it's not, then we'll also include that in, in our um, essentially request for proposals to brokers, asking them to, um, to submit a, a proposal as to what you want to do represent our properties to include, give us a price estimate, uh, give us a strategy on how you're going to market it. Um, you know, tell us how long you'd like exclusive representation, what your commission would be for closing. Those type of questions you ask as you solicit brokers, we thought we'd hold back on that if, in fact, we're going to have the 2150 property included in the, the, you know, the brokerage on the commercial piece. Finally, as you said, it, the Water Street property is very clear that that is a residential uh, land use issue and you know, those are kind of two birds of different feather, if you will. So we would want to get our own residential broker, knowing the market, to represent that vacant property and leave the commercial pieces, Tomley and 2150 West Main, to the brokerage firm uh, that more has more experience with commercial property. So we're asking that question, first of all, tonight, are you interested in considering uh, discussing with the Interfaith Food Pantry the possibility of their acquiring that land from the city uh, with ultimately the, the plan to relocate their construct a facility on that site. If that's out of the question, uh, then we can move ahead with our original plan, which was to uh, retain a commercial broker for that, that piece. Any comments, Dave? I'd like to, I see the mayor is raising his hand. I was going to say, I'd like to put the mayor on the spot here, not only because of his experience in the real estate business, but also as our mayor and tell us what he thinks we ought to do here. 
Well, I mean, I think the food pantry has a very stellar, very proud to be of record of service to the town. I mean, I think they, excuse me. The food pantry has done, I think, a remarkable job in putting Batavia first and the residents in this town first, and they've really done some wondrous things. And so I certainly would think it would not be out of order if we considered donating that property to the food pantry. The only issues I would raise with that is, is that that subdivision is part of a Tangley Burke Stratton early development, and there are some pretty tight covenants on that subdivision, including review of any new building that's being built there has to meet certain standards. And in anticipation of myself maybe making this suggestion to you tonight, I was just out there this afternoon, and I've been in there twice, when, the, when it was sunny and when it's dark. And all the other buildings in that property are made out of masonry, basically, except for the Golden Corral has a little something other than masonry on, on parts of it, but most everything else is brick and mortar. I think you would probably find, or if we gave it to them, they would find that they would probably have to meet some standard of construction in that manner and that they couldn't just go out there and build a pole building because you know there's, there's just been some major reinvestment in that area by the gentleman who took over the former Aldi store. He's done a beautiful job and he's done a lot of screening. And then there's a, a parking lot that's kind of in front of our piece that Aldi used to share with uh, Golden Corral, and that's still in rough shape. So there's some things that need to be done because I believe there is a homeowner's monthly assessment fee that's put to play there that you have to use to maintain things and replace pavement and street lights and whatever have you. So it would not be an inexpensive move for them to take it over, but certainly I think a donation of the land by the city would be in order. I, Laura and I talked about this earlier in this afternoon, and if there was enough room, you know, we're always looking for some months of the year for some storage area for toys that get donated for the toy drive. And so, uh, you know, maybe we could work out something or we could put some toys in part of it or something. But I, I don't mean to speak for the food pantry because they are here and can certainly speak for themselves, but I would certainly be pleased to put the idea before the council that we donate the land to them if in fact that's the way they want to go, knowing full well that there's, it's not going to be a, just an immediate slam dunk that you can go out there and put a pole building or something up there, there's going to have to be some, some probably some concrete in it and some architecture put into the place because they just won't, I don't think you'll get approval because everybody else has met the standard. Interestingly, within the last six weeks, I've had the mobile gas station in talking about, they're thinking about doing something out there. I don't think they're planning to get any smaller uh, as far as the building space go. I think they're looking to do something a little bit larger. And they haven't made any final decisions yet, but they're kind of in the in play out there too. And of course, across the street, on the other side of Rando at Maine, you know, we've in the, in the Moosehart annexation agreement, we've annexed and zoned that corner for it's about 40 acres for business development there. I don't know if we know what that business will be, but that is. So I mean, there will be a lot of you know activity out there and be high visibility and. <clears throat> Certainly a place that, you know, Batavia could pound its chest over that we're here doing this good work on behalf of some of our less fortunate residents. Any thought on the other properties? The other properties. The Timely Building and the North Water Street and how we should handle that? Well, I probably have had six or seven people in here over the years with the Timely Building <coughs> telling me that this potentially is the, <coughs> the most dynamite site in Batavia for a restaurant. Specifically, if you go down and put it on the river frontage down there, and if you look at the old configurations that were there when it was a third rail station, there was a covered depot in there, and people have shown me that picture and said, you know, if you put this building back and made a restaurant out of it and use the existing building as the kitchen, you could really have a dynamite situation going here to kind of feed on the existing tenacity of the downtown Batavia business district. So. I, I guess I would hesitant be to see us tear that down, but you know, if something came up, but just for somebody to tear it down to do something else, it wouldn't surprise me that somebody comes in here and says, we're gonna tear it down and put some kind of rental housing or condos or something in there too. That certainly would be 
an opportunity. If you look at the spots along the Fox River, you know, the views there, you got the bridge, but you've also got looking south there, that's a pretty good view of the river and you constantly can view the changing levels of the water and who's crossing the bridge and whatever have you. So I, it would be a very marketable property if you had some living units. So maybe a combination of a restaurant and living units, I don't know. But the bigger issue too may be there, how much parking is available because there's this kind of weird configuration of parking lot back there and we own part of it and I guess the Marconi family who owns the bank building owns part of it and I'm not sure who else may have a handle in it and it really is in need of being resurfaced. There's a lot, several bad potholes in there and you know there's a couple dumpsters sitting in the middle of it. It certainly could be jazzied up a lot better than it is right now. So that would be the, what's the third one you mentioned? Well, the North Water Street, but more, more particularly, I mean, I don't think that probably anybody here, we had this discussion at the last committee meeting that we should maybe look into getting rid of some of these properties, but more so the process here in the going out for an RFP and or working with a local realtor versus a big name Realtor, do you have any thought process? I'm not, I'm not going to get into the real estate business. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> oh, the one thing, you know, the, the one observation I would make is you, you know, the piece out there behind the old, I'll call it the old Aldi, which I talked about giving to the food pantry, we've had that on the market. There's a big sign out there, and, you know, we haven't really had meant much tire kicking on it, as far as I know. So that one. The one that I've, I've raised interest in is, is that our electric utility owns the old SOP farm out there on West Main Street, directly across the street from the uh, Grace McQueen School and uh, Tanglewood Subdivision. And I know that was originally bought because we thought we were going to have to put an electrical substation there, and maybe there is still some utility need there. but. I talked to the former owner today about that, and he's of the opinion he thinks there's 10 acres there, and some of which is probably the northern piece of it could be in some flood plain. But you could probably, I would think that would be a very marketable piece if we don't need that. I don't know what we would need 10 acres for a utility facilities for, but I mean, I think that we would get some <coughs> angst from the Tanglewood subdivision if we went to wild and willy with things there without some significant screening or whatever put around it because some of those homes trying to Alborowski maybe or or uh, Happner Way back up look right at that particular piece of property so you could see where uh, Alderman McFadden's uh, and your phone would be ringing, I think, about what's going to happen there. Well, I was going to ask if we wanted to consider that piece of property, too. I know at one time, yeah, it was going to be for an electric substation, and then there was some, when that didn't have to happen, we talked about keeping it for possibility of another salt storage shed out there or some other utility purposes, and I just don't know if we still think if Public Works, if staff has still got that same opinion, or... The water we... utility purchased that about eight years ago. Um, for the reason of potentially a future water treatment plant or supplemental treatment plant to what we already have, uh, both of the mainline water mains run right right in front of that property. So it, it, it's it's a parcel that the water department has kept and probably would desire to continue keeping uh, into the future because our water treatment plant, as you know, is not all of our property out there. When you when you drive out there, it's it's not. We don't own all that property. That that looks like it's all wide open and vacant. Uh, it is wide open and vacant, but it's not ours. So we're kind of landlocked out at our current treatment plant site and would very potentially need further treatment at some point in the future, and that's why we've kept that Main Street site. So wa uh, Water bought that from Electric? Yeah, about eight years ago. <clears throat> okay. I guess I kind of remember it after you mentioned it. But. It was right when I first started here. I think water paid two hundred fifty, three hundred thousand for it. And those would be that would be money that would go back into the enterprise funds for the utilities. That's so water, not general fund money water, that bought exactly. those. Yeah. yeah, water paid the electric utilities. Mm -hmm. I think it was three hundred thousand back then. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Dan? 
I was mentioning to a few people before we, we got started, um, I just recently joined a food pantry out in uh, Elmhurst. Uh, was pleasantly surprised to hear uh, of the volunteerism that was happening out there and the thinking outside the box that the, that organization was doing. They built a building, almost a million dollars, on land that was donated to them. Essentially, they're paying a dollar for 100 years uh, to be on that land. <clears throat> so for us to build a building out near the Aldi, it's, that's going to be a million dollars at the very least if we were to build it large enough to combine everything. You could put a clothes closet in there. You could put storage space for um, the toys. You could uh, have a very nice uh, food pantry out there. If we were to donate that land, is it possible that the city could consider giving a, not like a forgivable loan, but like a, a donation of some kind to get them started while they were building their own capital campaign? Uh, organizations like this have very large networks and, and could ultimately pay us back uh, if we, as a group, acknowledge that this is this is a community value. And I know Batavia has raised a million dollars before. I mean, there's a river walk out there, so it's not that we can't do this. Yeah, I guess my response to that would be, you know, whatever we can do. I am worried, as I've told you several times recently, about the status of municipal <laughs> finance in Illinois. And I don't know if I think this is the moment when I need to be throwing a lot of money out there that we may need other places. I mean, I'm not sure where we're going with this revenue. There's, I was on a call today, and legislature's down there about, apparently about to enact this property tax freeze, which, you know, we got one of the lowest ones around, so we'll probably be the, not hurt much. We certainly can't raise the taxes much and appear maybe on pensions if we had to. But so anything we've got now, we've got to make sure we got the revenue to pay for it. And, that being the case, I don't know if I think we got a lot of extra revenue that we can just kind of spin around. But certainly if we do this, I would think between the churches and everybody else, we could certainly find, kick the tire in the community and find out if there's other benefactors that would like to join in on our generosity here and support. All I'm getting at is that we could be really creative with the finance. If we could give them a bridge of some kind if they had a very serious capital campaign and knew that they could pay us back. I'm saying Batavia's done it before. I think that we could do it again. I don't think this would be long-term debt for us. I think it's something that could be paid off in three to five years. Lucy, there are quite a few people here from the food pantry. Do you want to see if they... All right. Yeah, is there anyone from the food pantry that would like to speak? Sure. <laughs> Give Thank us your you. name and address for the oh, record. My name is Betsy Zinzer, <laughs> and I am the director of the food pantry and clothes closet. And I'd like to step back for a couple minutes and go back to the beginning of this conversation that the food pantry has been having with um, city staff maybe for a couple of months now as we um, have approached them and they have approached us and we're trying to figure out a problem that we have. Um, for about 20 years, I think, the food pantry and clothes closet have operated out of this building at 100 Flynn Street. And we've also been utilizing the storage at the Old Baptist Church. And combined, that arrangement has been absolutely perfect, and we are so very grateful and very thankful for everything that it has offered us. Um, for the past 24 months, that arrangement has changed a lot. Uh, the old Baptist church was torn down, and when that happened, um, we lost our storage there. There was quite a bit of storage we had. We had one room for winter clothes, we had one room for summer clothes, we had one room for the food pantry and one room for seasonal items. And Pure Eye allowed us to move our stuff into their basement. It's a much smaller facility, but we're very happy to have it. But we're also there at their will. It, if they were to sell their building or do something else, we'd have to find a new home. Um, in addition to that change, uh, the water treatment plant expanded, as you know, and um, we lost this area outside our building, which we used in our operations. We used it to process our food drive donations. Um, we used it to host job fairs. We used it to do um, flu shots and health screenings. Um, we used it to, for our holiday turkey drive distribution. And we are either trying to adapt to those the absence of that, um, or just not do those things. So this year we did not have any job fairs. We did not have any flu shots. Um, and then as you know, I think it was a couple weeks ago, you all voted about parking and you 
so kindly voted to keep the parking along Flint Street. Um, so I think that the amount of parking that would be city along that street would be about 18, 19 parking spaces. I don't remember exactly. But when we operate on a normal day, we have between 40 or 50 parking spaces that we fill. And we park in BEI parking. And that works because the space there they park in front of that limestone building is currently used by the city. It's sort of warehouse space. But if BEI were to get a tenant that needed that parking, we would not have it. So we would either have to use parking down along Shumway in that lot that's about two blocks away along the river, or we'd have to go up to the um, Walgreens parking lot. I'm not quite sure how we would get everybody in. Um, so those are three challenges that the food pantry is facing now as we're looking forward. What, what are we gonna do in the long term? So simultaneously the bike path happened. And we had meetings about where is the bike path gonna go. And in those meetings, a couple city employees said, would you consider moving? And we said, sure, we'd consider moving. We love where we are. Downtown is a better location than anywhere else. But um, we understand that we, it might not always work where we are. Um, so we're looking for a way to serve the community in the same way we have been serving it for many years um, to try to maintain that. Um, so money, I guess that's sort of what you all are trying to figure out how, and we're trying to figure out how would we pay for this, right? Um, we can't afford a million dollar building. Um, we can do a capital campaign. Capital campaigns for food pantries and probably most not-for-profits run in a November, December, early January timeframe. Almost all money is raised during that period of time. So what we're really looking at, if we were going to do a capital campaign, is 12 months from now to kick in. A um, million dollars sounds like an incredible amount of money. Our operating each month, I mean, each year is maybe $180,000. So um, that's not the level of money we typically raise. So that would be a, a, we would need your support as we have had your support. And um, you provide the building to us, you provide electric to us. Um, the gas, I believe, is provided for by NICOR. We do not pay those things, and we depend on that to be able to make our monthly budget work. So as you're discussing this and you're thinking about how we might move forward, um, we want to serve, and we will are willing to serve in a capacity, whether it is downtown Batavia or whether it's west of Randall, we are willing to do a fundraising campaign to raise as much money as we can, but I, it, when you threw it a million dollars, I, I just can't imagine that happening on our end. So um, I don't know if there's any questions that you might have for the food pantry folks. Gary? If I could just hop in, uh, you, you also um, you want to talk about, because you guys had requested or at least had, at, had staff look at possibly expanding the, your current site. Oh, right. So we thought, okay, what if we expand our existing site? And we met with Scott. And Scott said, well, if you add a square foot, you're going to have to put in a sprinkler system, and that's going to be cost like $70,000 or $80,000 or something. And we need a new roof because the roof is leaking. And... Um, to, we are at the outer edge of everything, and we would have to get all these zoning code changes to expand even an inch. I think that we would be outside of all. It just was did not look possible for us to expand where we are. So that we started there. That was our initial plan. Okay, let's put in an ADA compliant bathroom and do the things that would be appropriate for a food pantry, and that just really wasn't possible after we had met with Scott. Okay. Let's see, how many square feet do you have there now? Oh, that's a good question. I think if you combine the existing storage and our building now, it's about 3,500 square feet. And obviously, you'd probably let, you would want to go larger, so you could house the... 
storage. Story drive and right, everything right. else you got needs storage. I mean, what you've got right now is about 3,500 square feet. Right, exactly. I think a million dollars would be on the low side. I'm Marty. Yeah, I just have a question of we know that the the laws surrounding selling property up to you know we have to accept 80% of the value. What are the laws regarding how we donate so that another um, another very reputable organization goes well? Where's our donation for land um, so that we open make sure that it's a a fair process for all worthwhile charities that would just say it's a noble cause how we support it but what about another group that may want to do something with it too how do you uh, since we know on sales it's it's very tightly regulated how does it go for donations what's the process for that it's a question for me <laughs> if you know I I don't know. I would That's really probably need to look from into Kevin that. Kevin to exactly just so that we wouldn't have another organization that's very worthwhile. You know, suicide prevention sure. services come in and just go. We could do something with that property too. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It would seem that maybe the arrangement that Alderman Chanson mentioned that even if the city kept ownership but then leased mm -hmm. the property to the food pantry for a dollar mm -hmm. for the next hundred years, we keep ownership. We're not donating anything. And that was one thing that I was kind of wondering, because then that's no different than the kind of the situation that we already have. But if we were wanting to use it as a donation instead, um, so that if, if it got deeded into their names and they obtained conventional financing on the property as a means of, fi uh, means of financing the project, they could possibly do that. Mm -hmm. But that would need to make sure that it was still within the realms of, can we do that? Right. Marty, I think you bring up a good point, though, is when you mentioned suicide prevention, because let's maybe think bigger picture. It is a fairly large lot. I'm not sure how many square feet of building it would support, um, but maybe that's where you ought to start, is look at what it would support, and then maybe you, it couldn't, you could join forces out there with other agencies that maybe have got other ways and means of fundraising and capital and, and such. And, I'm just trying to think outside the box here of how <laughs> that, we can make this work. Idea. That was exactly where I was kind of thinking that if we had maybe three or four organizations, if it fit, then who's to say you don't have a, a nice little area over there for, for others that, you know, you know, maybe they can't do it on their own, but if they partnered with right. somebody else and if it's given to them on the land, I don't know, but it's the kind of right. being creative on it but I know we're tied on conventional selling the property, so I would just want to make sure we're doing everything right all around. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing I, I'd sorry. like to interject here is, is I believe we were given that piece of property that we're talking about. It's kind of like the yeah. gas station site out at, at uh, Wilson. And I understand Burke. that property was given to mm -hmm. the city. Right. We, we were we were given to one. We turned around and... We've also got the uh, detention area behind it. Mm -hmm. Sold for six hundred and seventy-one thousand out there on Kirk Road, and this one, you know, I'm proposing that we do something to try to service the community. I don't, you know, you know, leasing it, renting it, whatever. It, but I, I think that I don't want anybody to think, oh, the city paid a bunch of money for this property, and now they're giving it away. We didn't pay anything for the property. Yeah, it occurred to me when Alderman Brown asked, you know, what can be built on there. You know, obviously, there you got 1.4 acres. That's a pretty good sized piece of property, over 60,000 square feet. If you go two stories, for instance, uh, you know you have to add some ADA accessibility, which drives up costs. But then you reduce the footprint and allows for more parking. And maybe the thought is the city retain it, uh, the city arrange some way that they would also own the structure on the building, and we simply lease it. And it's a community center that we just happen to temporary use are these multiple, hopefully multiple type of uh, not-for-profit uses, all co-located. Maybe they can, the economies of scale associated with transportation costs and, and, and parking. And so that's, that's an interesting idea to explore. I'm glad it's been discussed because it, it does give me real pause not to push the idea of getting it out there and put it on the commercial market. We've got other land to, to sell and develop. 
besides that. Which is obviously what you're up here looking for tonight, some direction mm -hmm. on what that's we correct. should be doing, not how we're going to Right, no, that's too far down the spec. Out, yeah. My thought is if, if I can get some direction, let's hold off on the 2150. Uh, I'll go ahead and find a broker for the Water Street as well as the Tomley building. I'll also develop that RFP, but I think we'll use that RFP for the Tomley building in conjunction with discussing with the broker what, what kind of proposals we want to see. And uh, then let the market kind of, you know, work its way into um, free enterprise. Alan? As I sit here and I listen to this, I think I heard, I think it was, you know, somebody else bring up the fact that we're parking next door to the food pantry in front of a BEI building that the city is temporarily using. And I hear the words BEI and I hear the city owned property that we have out on Main Street. BEI is a property manager. They have a lot of land. They've done a lot of things with it. They sold it, traded by whatever. What would include us from taking the land that we have out there, trading it with BEI for the property that we're actually using today across the street from the current food pantry, retaining the food pantry, put a roof on that, use it for storage, move the food pantry into the BEI building that's there, figure out what square footage we could get from them in the trade for the property that we have out on Main Street and let them deal with developing it and getting rid of it as a property land manager. I, I mean, I, I, I'm just thinking out of the box. Thought. I don't know what the values are It would keep the food pantry equal. downtown. It would keep all the local accessibility, I think, issues that we have right now. You'd have the parking still in front of it. You'd have it in an area where it's become familiar to the people that use it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it would probably speak to Alderman Callahan's consideration about how do we make it a level playing field. Mm -hmm. What you do is you do a proposal to exchange land mm -hmm. and that the land that you desire in the exchange be a swap associated with a property and give it kind of a geographical location so very few people really uh, would be able to have an eligible property to swap mm -hmm. uh, you I, I think that would make it legal at any rate without having to worry about a whole slew of different property owners uh, having different types of proposals and I just, you know, thinking out of the side of the box, that to me reuses the property that's already there and then gives the viability for property in the commercial area to generate some kind of sales tax at some point if it gets developed into something that can generate sales tax. Well, so, Chris. There probably have, have to be some boot between the. If right. the values are different, there's a boot you have to make. It right. Make we, we could, you know. We have enough property, they have enough property, we can figure something out if they would be willing to even discuss that. You know, I think that to me, I would feel a lot better about doing that than starting from zero, ground zero on a blank slate mm -hmm. and getting us into something that, you know, I'm not afraid of the million dollar number, but if we can't do that and we get halfway into it, then what do we do? Well, it could also put some retail on Randall Road. Right. That's where we my other thought. Would otherwise be eliminating the mm -hmm. pantry going out there. And if we retain ownership, no tax money off of yeah. it. So I think it's a great, great ideas and things to everybody to kick around. But in the meantime, mm -hmm. Chris, right? Has got direction and I think he's got the direction. Do you, you do have the direction things. you want to hire a broker? You guys for for the sure. Tomley building and and one for the North Water Street. Water. I think the other question is still up for further discussion. Mm -hmm. Can Can Mike? I ask a question? No. Certainly, Chris. Did you say that? We're going to not tear down. We're going to give direction not to tear down the Tomley building. That's I thought the consensus the other night was when I originally drafted the RFP, there was a condition that we would exclude any proposals that specifically involved the demolition and remove the building. And the consensus I, I thought was why tie our hands to, to that requirement? Why not open it up without that and see what comes forward? Because someone might be very creative in the redevelopment and, and, you know, adding value to the property while still being sensitive to the historic district. So I would exclude that as a condition in the sale. Right. I mean, that, that was my it, fear. I, I think that was your original. Just kind of mm -hmm. limiting our exposure there. And, 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 you know, I'm not advocating to tear it down. <laughs> but if a project comes along, that that is quite interesting and, and and we've tore other buildings down in the city mm -hmm. not that i'm proud of that or any or anything like that but if it's going to make us help us move forward as a city i think it's something as as it is now as an incubator 
it's nice. It's a feel good, but it's not moving us forward, you know. And so, uh, so I'm not opposed to tearing it down if that was the last alternative. I guess is what I'm saying. Okay. Any other thoughts? Okay. Got what you need. Thank you. Thank you. Next item is item seven, which is the discussion of the food pantry and the toy drive. <laughs> kind of skipping around here tonight yeah. a little bit. <laughs> okay, anything else to discuss on that tonight? I... Anybody have anything? Okay. Item eight, discussion on the solid waste contract. Alderman Wolf. I didn't have a memo for that, so we'll let Gary take it then. <laughs> Um, I don't remember the original year, the mayor may know, uh, when we had a solid waste contract back in 2004, 2005. What I do know is that contract ended in 08, because that was the year I started here. And 08 was the throes of the Great Recession. And that contract, when they, when they would expire, they actually offered us very favorable fuel surcharges. I don't know if you remember back then, everyone was talking about fuel surcharge. So we ended up staying with that same contractor for four more years. Um, Come 20, late part of 2011, early part of 2012, we met with Geneva and St. Charles to talk about going out for a joint bid for solid waste. Uh, St. Charles had a very aggressive contract at that time. Um, theirs was up, but they had a good clause to extend, so they chose to just extend their contract. And Geneva and, and, and ourselves, we joined together to form a con common contract document so that the contract document was identical for both communities. Um, we worked together to coordinate pickup days. And if you recall, we had to change our pickup day with, the, with, this, with this contract. Um, but we bid it out as two separate contracts. Legally, it's two separate contracts. But the contractors were essentially bidding on a larger project because they were bidding them both at the same time. So obviously, Advanced Disposal won that bid back in 2012. And now their contract is up next year. So I think Laura mentioned last night that we had met last week with um, representatives from this time Geneva and St. Charles. St. Charles has actually now got themselves on the same cycle as us. And so they're going to be going out this time as well or interested this time um, in, in, in looking at solid waste. So jumping back a couple of months, I, I believe Laura and, and I don't know who else it was that met with advanced disposal folks, they came in to talk with you. Mm -hmm. Advanced disposal folks have also talked with the managers in, in Geneva and St. Charles. They've talked with the staffs. They met with Scott Haynes and myself three or four weeks ago now. Um, advanced disposal would prefer if we didn't go out to bid and if we were able to just renegotiate with them. Um, we talked internally amongst the staff last week. St. Charles and Geneva both feel that that might be a possibility in their communities. Um, and we're a little hesitant about it, and that's why we're coming here to see if you guys, if that's a non-starter. Um, some more background. I think it's Alburn, and, and anyway, Alburn Sugar Grove, somewhere out west there now has, and, and again, it may not even be applicable to us, but they have a, a hauler that's coming in from Rockford to service those areas. Again, they're that much farther west than us, so it may make more sense. That contractor has given them a, 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 a rate that is just amazing. So, um, Groot, actually has Oswego, which is where I live, we pay a lot less than what we're paying here. So I guess Scott Haynes and myself were a little hesitant uh, to not go out to bid because of the fact that there are some really generous contracts out there now. Um, but on the same hand, you know, staying with Advance and telling Advance, you know, yeah, we'll sit at the table with you and, and you know, if you want to keep our business, you're going to have to come up with a really aggressive proposal. There's some leverage to that, too, because Advance already has all their infrastructure in place here to serve us, and it's their interest to, to continue to serve us as well as St. Charles. So we're open to that idea of sitting with them and talking with them, but we didn't even want to approach that or even didn't want to consider that without coming to you first, because if that's, again, a non-starter, you guys just saying that we have to go out for bid, certainly understandable, and that's the direction we'll head. So I guess that was the, the idea tonight was do we want to at least have discussions with it, with advance about not going off for bid and, and negotiating directly with them for the next contract, or should we just begin the process of preparing bid documents? Can, why can't they just bid like everyone else? Well, they, they can and probably will. Okay. Jeff? 
you know, obviously this is on the street and there's a lot of people who know what's going on in the waste disposal business. Laura and I have been invited to have a meeting on Thursday afternoon, it is, with one of the competitors. They'd like to come in and probably should have Gary come down, but I mean, there's people on the doorstep literally here wanting to talk about this contract, so I think we're in a pretty good position to leverage some good bid for the community here. So when I got them coming on Thursday to want to talk to us, we should, I think we should at least listen to what everybody's saying. I think there's other opportunities here too. I, I, Gary, you, you know a whole lot more about this than I do, but and what exactly Batavia gets as compared to what other municipalities get other than pricing. You know, I know Advance picks up all of our public waste our, our transfer agreement. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, do do we get, when we have festivals, do they pick that up free of charge? Yeah. Um, I, I think some municipalities have got what they call community dumpsters that are paid for by the municipality, but then maintained and cleaned up and everything by the disposal companies and then the public or the, the the public prop, not public, prop, the private properties that use it. In other words, like in Naperville, where they've got all the restaurants, they used to have dumpsters everywhere. Now they've got a community dumpster. Mm -hmm. Each restaurant owner, each building owner has a swipe card. They take their garbage out, they use their swipe card, they get charged for the garbage every time the swipe card goes in. But the disposal company was a partner in putting that together. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunities here besides pricing on what we can negotiate with them to help the city yeah they would like I mean one example of that alderman is they would like us to go to an all cart cart program which we've always been hesitant to do because we have a number of people in town who don't even fill up don't know use one sticker a week and they use maybe less than one sticker a week we have the half bag program so there those are things that you could sit at the table with or we'll sit with bid documents and try and work through those options and that's a separate discussion for a separate night <clears throat> it's those exact things downtown dumpsters customize the program to fit the most people in town um, things like our hall our uh, transfer station there is a benefit we added geneva to our transfer station they didn't previously their waste didn't go through our transfer station so we get an economic benefit by having done the joint bid and now having their waste to go through our transfer station. So there's positives and negatives to, to, to both sides of it. So. Speaking of the transfer station, are we at limit out there? Or can they still bring in more than they're bringing every day? Honestly, I don't know, but I can <coughs> find that out. I know we can find out because they pay a tipping fee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just don't know the answer off my head, off top. We increased the amount that they could push through there. What's that? We increased the amount that they could push through there. Right. Years I just ago. don't know if they're hitting that up to the top of it the, yet. That yeah. cap, or if they're maybe that could be like you say. You know, it, if they're not at their cap, then we could say that you must use our the waste transfer station located in our town. Right. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know how you, how you do that. I'm just again like the last subject thinking outside the box. <laughs> Creative tonight. Outside the can. And I think not too long ago, the mayor talked about when we um, negotiate the next garbage contract, maybe talking about getting the leaf pickup, the bag pickup changed so it's not just December, as was talked about last night. Right. The leaves aren't falling this year, and the snow's supposed to start coming this weekend. So, you know, maybe it needs to be changed so that it's November and December that they pick up the bags. Those are all options. Those are exactly the types of options we can work and talk with you about. And those are things that we can... I mean, as far as we're concerned, again, Geneva and St. Charles being the same, if we decide to sit down with advance, we're sitting down with advance in our mind with a clean slate. This isn't just take the existing contract and give us a few more years and we're going to follow all these same terms and conditions because we may want to change things yeah. like that. Um, and you don't necessarily have that opportunity when you go out for bid. Well, we do, though. No, we actually have that opportunity when we go out for bid. Because when we go out for bid, we would create a whole bid document that would be... Right, yeah. but you can't negotiate something more after you've gone out to bid. No, yes, you're right. right. Once you've gone out to bid and you have right. those things, that, that is what you have. You can't, you can't change it at that point. We had some alternates last time. In fact, one of the alternates was to change our collection day to, to, to better mesh with Geneva, and we ended up choosing that alternate for less cost. Is there anything wrong with sitting down with advance first to see if you think you can come up with a favorable agreement before you come back to us and say you'd like to go out for bid? I don't know. Yeah, can we do both? 
Yeah. Yeah. We can do both, but we didn't want to even go down that road until we knew what your guys' well, direction. I think Thank it'll you. be interesting Thursday to hear what right. somebody from the outside says after yeah. they've seen what the public documents are that we've yeah. already approved on these contracts. To me, that's one of them? that's one of the things they're going to come in to talk to right. you guys about. What are they going to bring they're going to come in and say, well, we can do it for X dollars less, and we can do the same service. This is what we do, and I'm, I'm sure that that's their sales pitch. And then that's something that you can sit down at the table with advance with. You know, the fact they don't want to negotiate it, they or they'd rather just negotiate it rather than bid it. Right. right. Says they know it. Yeah. That there's there's some play in the market, and mm -hmm. they want to. When do you need an answer, Gary? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're here because we did not want to sit down with advance, begin negotiating for something that wasn't the bidding process without well, without council's right. direction. Right. I mean, our, our standard direction is we go off a bit, and if, if and we are fully comfortable with sitting down with advance, if council is okay with that approach. But but can you wait a week to uh, get that direction from us? Oh yeah. <laughs> Let us think about it and talk about it a little bit. <laughs> right. Do we have to lodge a protest? <laughs> Too soon. Too soon. <laughs> Ten of us have to agree. Okay, so why don't we put this on the agenda for next Tuesday? Sure. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, item nine, project status. Yeah, this is always hard when it's the day after I've given the status of all of the projects the night before. <laughs> but um, because we covered so much territory yesterday, maybe it bears mentioning some of the community and economic development projects that I mentioned last night and some of the um, public works projects in case you guys had any questions about those. Um, community and economic development, we talked about the fact that um, there are several properties that we are um, planning to annex on Whipple. So there's our scheduling, the um, community development department is scheduling public hearings for uh, the December plan commission meetings for those properties. And also a park district lot on South River Street and a couple of city owned open space and detention parcels as well. That's part of the project that Scott Buning has of, uh, he likes to call it uh, kind of closing those donut holes that exist in a, within our city map. Um, also this week we met with the developer of Catherine's Cove that's um, off of First Street to discuss the um, engineering feedback and to review other comments that were made with them. Um, also, we received an initial land use review application for the Villas of White Oaks development, which would be off of South Radnant Road. And this will probably come to uh, be before the Committee of the Whole in December. Um, the hotel feasibility study in response to a request for proposals. We've received six proposals from professional consulting firms. And so um, staff is going to be reviewing those proposals. And uh, we plan to make a selection by uh, this Friday at the, at the latest. Um, let's see. Looking at the public works projects, of course, we talked about the Tonka filter last night that um, you don't know until you open up uh, that uh, filter to know what kind of condition it is, but we were happy to see that the structural integrity of what is inside there was uh, better than expected. Um, and then also we are continuing to work on the proposed draft of an updated pole attachment agreement with Comcast. We have a franchise agreement, but we do not have a pole attachment agreement. And one of the things we're trying to do is keep an even playing field with all of the different communications companies that um, come in and want to attach their apparatus to our electric um, poles that we're um, maintaining the same standards with regard to each one of those companies, whether it be the notice that they have to provide us for what they're going to be attaching and um, 
and get the appropriate permits to um, the amounts of time that we give them. For instance, if um, some of their equipment becomes obsolete and unused, um, that there's a certain period of time within which they need to remove that equipment because all of it has to do with the load that um, is borne by all of our electric poles throughout the city. And our number one concern, and, and Mike, you pointed it out before, that this is our electric utility. And we wanna make sure that we maintain the integrity of our electric utility. And so while we um, like to accommodate the use of the poles for the communications companies, our primary goal is to maintain the integrity of the um, electric service that we're able to provide to our customers. Um, and that's all that I have, unless there are specific projects that you wanted to ask me about. Yeah, I'm sorry, I remembered one more thing. At yesterday's meeting, we were talking about the date for the public hearing on the budget. And you noticed that um, Peggy had, had come up to correct the information that I was given. Well, a little more research was done on that today. It actually um, is just a one week notice provision. So the date for the public hearing for our budget is going to be um, November 14th. And the meeting on the 14th will start at 7 o'clock p.m. and the public hearing will begin at 7.30. So it gives us a little time in case there's issues that we needed to resolve from the last meeting. Um, and then we'll begin the public hearing on uh, at 7.30. Um, we do not have a budget hearing scheduled at this point for November 28th. We're going to see if that um, meeting is necessary um, and we'll see where we're at on the 14th to determine whether or not an additional budget meeting is necessary. So that's all I have. Laura, can you update us on Excuse the branding? The mic, can you please update us on the branding process and the strategic planning decision-making process? Sure, I'll start with the branding. Okay. Um, I believe this week, um, the Marianne Rood from um, Spark Inc. was um, finishing up the very last of the interviews for the aldermen. And following that, they're going to wrap up their report on the research. Um, and we have asked them to come to a committee of the whole meeting to present the results of that research because it's very important that um, all of you feel that the um, inferences that they are drawing from all of the interviews that they conducted and all of the 800 surveys that were returned are things that you see as, as consistent with, um, uh, it's, it's saying the right things about our community, that that's, you know, uh, that they, they seem to have gotten that part right because that's important it's the basis for the work that's going to come next which is the creation of the the branding itself and um, so we'll have the meeting um, regarding the um, results of the research in December and we hope that they will then turn around um, and within four to six weeks come back to us with the branding itself. But one of the things that I'd like to mention is that um, my understanding, it happened prior to me coming on board, but that the branding project itself was initiated by a discussion that city council had about monument signs. And um, the question as to whether we should simply um, fix and repair the existing monument signs or replace them with something different. And then the discussion was, are the, um, the things that are on our monument signs, are those really a, a current reflection? And um, I would propose, uh, we do have proposed in the 2018 budget, six monument signs. We, we have a budget for that. I'm, I'm not sure that that needs to be entirely tied to this branding project itself because my impression of monument signs at places I travel to is simply that it is uh, identifying the, the community that I'm entering and saying, oh, you know, welcome 
to our community. And so I'm not sure anything more than welcome to the city of Batavia is, you know, what we necessarily want to have on those monument signs. So what is branding? I think branding is something, and, and uh, it's Main Street is our partner in this project because they have let us know that they have $50,000 that was a grant to them um, to produce wayfinding through our community. And I think branding is something that um, reveals itself in our uh, communications, such as our website, um, the wayfinding through the community, uh, publications that we produce. Um, our letterhead, but um, I, you know, I'd, I'd like to hear your feedback on my thoughts about that. I think part of um, the, the part of the need for branding also was, as I recall, wayfinding. The yeah. two combined came up. Oh yes, about the same wayfinding. time. Um, I I have some thoughts about branding and signage, but I'm not ready to say them yet. Me. Um, we, I, re I remember these conversations well, because we talked about should that just say, you know, welcome to Batavia. Should it be similar to what we have now? Should it be uh, stone with something? I mean, and that's how we went down the slippery slope of branding, because it was not um, enough just to have signs that say, you know, like. North Aurora has their new ones, and South Elgin has their new ones. It had to have a brand to go with these signs, and so then it, it further meandered down to the wayfinding and everything else. And so that's how we got to this point. And we're t two years in, would you say? <laughs> Drew, you were, Carl was still here, and I know Kevin Botterman was here, and so we had these discussions, and would you say at least two years that we've been talking about just the entry signs that are crumb falling apart on the It's entrances? been probably six years we've been talking about Is that. Has it really yeah. been six? <coughs> wow. Time flies when you're having fun. Mm -hmm. Are we having fun? Mm -hmm. Scott? So when it comes to branding, you know, you, you can't create your own brand. You, you can define it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, brand is the experience that people have with you. Mm -hmm. So you can hold, you can manage it, you can try and manage it, and you know through you know your process, through your you know your visuals, through wayfinding, through that. I would say that our our monument signs are would be part of that. Um, I mean, if, if you want to try and influence someone, you're going to do that at every point of communication. And you are right, letterhead, your your signature block on the bottom of your email, uh, website. It it all works together, so it needs to be cohesive. So I, you know, it may not necessarily have to be, you know, um, a specific design for your monuments, but I think it needs to be taken into consideration. Mm -hmm. Whatever you know, whatever we do, um, you know, that we've got North Aurora with their new, you know, their, their new stuff, whether you like it or not. Um, I mean, that that is that's a very design intense, you know, or uh, not intense, but it's a, a very specific design that they are carrying through their entire community. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, th that's something we have to make a decision on. We can go forward with whatever you, whatever you want. I mean, that's, but the idea is you, you want to step back and wherever you're making a, a touch and as far as communication goes, you want to try and control that mm -hmm. and, try and, and try and have some consistency. I would hope that we get the results back from the branding um, in January, February time frame, and um, at that time make a judgment as to um, how that should influence the design of our uh, monument signs. Okay. If that's okay. So we're good with that for now? And the next question was strategic planning. Use the mic, please. Next question, strategic planning. Yes, it was July when uh, we received our proposals for strategic planning. And in August and September, we interviewed um, several firms that had submitted proposals. And we met about it, um, I think, last 
in September. And I apologize that uh, with the couple of major projects that we've had going on, um, I re really haven't had a, an opportunity to move that forward. But um, what I do propose doing is um, having that be a first quarter of uh, 2018 um, process. And I have been working on a um, memo just to share with all of you um, the, the, uh, uh, what the two different firms that <laughs> we were strongly considering as appropriate partners in strategic planning, what each of them brought to the table. As well, um, I've spoken with um, references that have worked with both of those firms, so I wanted to share the results of that too. And I'd like to put that perhaps on a future Committee of the Whole agenda for a, a, discuss, a discussion all unto itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Edit, Lucy? Yes, thank you. Sure. Mark? Um, Laura, I sent you and the mayor uh, that email about the dam again um, because of my friend's experience with uh, Army Corps and saying, hey, don't just sit back, make sure we're constantly pegging Army Corps and IDNR to make sure that we're on their radar. So I don't know if either of you have any contacts. He did not have any contacts in IDNR that he could point us in the direction of, but we don't want to be the last ones on the list um, if there's something that they do come up with. Right. Um, so I did a couple of things in, in that regard, and I had copied you on my communications with the um, the contact that um, your friend had provided for the Army Corps of Engineers, and she said that um, when they went into the um, lack of a budget, all work stopped on the dam projects along the Fox River. And even in, um, is it the Kankakee Dam? Uh, so IDNR will prioritize their dam projects according to the most dangerous dams. And uh, fortunately for Batavia, uh, we, we are not in the situation where we've had um, fatalities at our dam. So once the projects begin again, IDNR has indicated that that's the way that they're going to prioritize projects. So the likelihood they're going to focus on Kankakee, the, uh, the, the next project that is shovel ready is, uh, my understanding is the North Aurora Dam was ready to go when the funding um, stopped. But we do, um, keep in regular communication with IDNR to make sure that um, if, if there's any possibility, but you know, the, um, the, the issue with our dam is the most expensive part of that process would be if we want our, to have our dam removed, that's the only project I think that they would help us with, would be removing it, not repairing it. Um, the most expensive part of that process would be if we want to maintain the pond, that's an extremely expensive proposition. I think that was uh, an $8 million proposition when we looked at it back in 2008. <clears throat> but yes, we, we will stay in regular communication with IDNR so that we'll know when, um, they'll know that we want to do something. Thank you. I have the opportunity in at CMAP to talk to ID and our people with some regularity. And what Laura just said is exactly true. Uh, the whole thing is it's all wrapped up in the city budget, city, state budget crisis. And the state budget crisis is at proportions the likes of which nobody's ever seen. And so the, the conventional wisdom in there is it's going to take a couple of years for things to kind of wash out, no pun intended, before they're going to be in a position to even really seriously begin to have some conversations. So the, you know, how many times have you heard somebody say the million dollar question? So the six to eight million dollar question is, how did your meeting go with the one Washington Street developer today? I understand that at yesterday's meeting, I might have been delirious at that point and said it was today. It's tomorrow. Oh. Sorry. You beat me. But I'll be happy to let you all know how it goes. That would be great. 
Thank you. Anybody else have anything? Marty? I just want to, um, I, I think Chris had seen this article about talking about the craft breweries and their kind of niche in revitalization of downtown areas. And I just wanted to say the uh, they, Energy City Brewing had their first bottle opening uh, this <laughs> past this past weekend, and they sold completely out. And yeah. everybody was there and having a great yeah. time. It was a wonderful event. And, and I think going forward, December 2nd their next one. They said they were having some people line up last time. I'm pretty sure it's going to be like the Goose Island annual release where we'll start having a lineup of people, and they're bringing a, a great excitement to downtown, and it brought – a ton of people down there specifically for that so yes was it good it was and it, good and it's going to be it's going to be one of those opportunities kind of finding those small little niche creative things that are going to really help the downtown yes so kudos to the files for starting that here mm -hmm. cool. anybody else motion to adjourn so moved. Moved. second <laughs> there okay who did it <laughs> Motion by Salvati, second by Malay. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is carried. <laughs>